A radical takes the reins in Argentina. Warning the economy will get worse before it gets better, President Javier Millet is promising to right the wrongs of government's past. From pitching dollarization to parting ways with China and his neighbors, how radical will Millet really be? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Javier Millet. On Sunday, Javier Millet was inaugurated in Buenos Aires, taking power in a country that was once predicted to become one of the world's most powerful economies. But since the mid-20th century, Argentina's financial performance has seen an endless cycle of boom and bust, becoming the IMF's biggest debtor. Mismanagement and corruption can be blamed for most of it, so it's no wonder Argentinians are furious and frustrated. Q. Javier Millet, a political outsider who promised to take a chainsaw to the old system. But does his radical rhetoric represent much needed change or just more chaos to come? That debate in just a minute, but first a look at Argentina and its new leader. Unfortunately, I have to tell you again that there is no money. The stark reality of just how much trouble Argentina's economy is in. As 53-year-old Javier Millet took office, he left Argentinians in no doubt that they're heading towards harsh austerity measures. And the country appears ready for drastic action. As a self-described anarcho-capitalist, Malay campaigned on a policy of radical change. This resonated with the electorate, and he received 55.7% of the vote at last month's general election. Argentinians resoundingly have expressed a desire for change that has no return. There's no going back. Today we bury decades of failures, infighting, and senseless disputes. South America's second largest economy is suffering over 140% annual inflation. The currency has plunged, and a quarter of the population now lives in poverty. Argentina has a massive trade deficit, and it owes $45 billion to the IMF, with a $10 billion payment due to the fund and its debtors by April. This has been blamed on economic mismanagement that stretches over decades. Until the Great Depression, Argentina was among the richest countries in the world. Its slow pace of industrialization, as well as the grip landowners held on the political system, saw its economy slip. To prevent history from repeating itself, Malay says he'll abolish the central bank, replace Argentina's currency with the dollar, and slash a host of government departments. But it's unclear just how the new president will approach the job in practice. There are indications he's softened some of his rhetoric since winning the presidential race. But just hours into the job, he signed a decree reducing the number of government departments from 18 to 9, making good on one election pledge. Before his inauguration, Malay met with U.S. National Security and Treasury Department members. Washington officials say they're willing to help Malay's new government make the transition to power. But U.S. interest in Argentina's politics has to do with the growing ties between Buenos Aires and Beijing. China is Argentina's second largest trading partner, and it has helped the country through recent economic woes. As the newly elected president enters his first days in office, Argentinians have no doubt he intends to embark on an economic path unlike any other previous president. So is Argentina embarking on a path to the radical change it needs, or will Millet's symbolic chainsaw also take down an already struggling standard of living? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are, from Washington, Michael Shifter. He's the former president of and now senior fellow at Inter-American Dialogue. Also from the U.S. Capitol, Jimena Sanchez Garzoli is a human rights advocate at the Washington Office on Latin America. And from London, Christopher Wilde is a senior lecturer in politics and international relations specializing in Argentina at St. Mary's University. Thanks all so much for being with me. So he is warned shock treatment uh, is in the cards and that it will get worse before it gets better. Uh, let me start with Michael then. Do you think his you know, unorthodox strategy can actually work? And how much patience is the big question will Argentinians actually have to test it all? Well, I think that, uh, you know, those those are the big questions, and I don't think anybody knows the answers uh, right now. What we do know is that there have been previous attempts 
to try to address these problems, and they haven't really worked out very well, and uh, of different political uh, parties. So uh, it's an enormously uphill battle. The economy is in terrible, terrible shape. And um, I think what was notable yesterday, I guess, for some grounds for, if you want to call it possible uh, hope, is that, uh, you know, Millet in his speech said, um, we're broke, we're broke. And the crowd chanted, yes, we're broke. We have no money. So uh, perhaps the key uh, to his uh, presidency will be managing expectations. He said that we're going to have a lot of pain. There's going to be a lot of suffering. Mm. But uh, eventually, we'll get back on the road to some sort of economic stability. Uh, whether people will be able to uh, have that patience um, is unclear. They're going to be clearly very, very hard uh, adjustments. And, um, and, yeah. and I think we can expect uh, protests uh, of some sort uh, that are already in, in the works, I'm sure. And, um, you know, it's going to be very, very tough. I don't think anybody thinks it's going to be easy. And I think it was good in his speech. He said this is going to be very, very difficult. Mm. So, I mean, Jimena, do you think Argentinians are really prepared for, for it getting worse? And do you think they are also prepared for the prospect that Argentina actually can go. I know a lot of people have said they cannot have more of the same. That is the least acceptable option. Fine, if they can't have more of the same, okay, but can they accept bad getting even worse, as is possible with untested people like Javier Millet? Well, um, thank you for having me on. I just returned from Argentina where there's an obvious desperation on all levels of society about the situation that just doesn't seem to get any better and a lot of uh, disgruntledness over the past administrations. I think that um, I'm not sure they're going to be ready to have things get worse. I think he's setting the stage for that. The big question is going to be, how is he going to respond when we see mass demonstrations in Argentina? Argentines are known for always taking to the streets to air out uh, their concerns or criticisms. Uh, we are concerned, uh, given some of the rhetoric during the campaign that was incredibly polarizing, that uh, the response might be repressive, and then that might turn things into a really uh, difficult situation. We know that it's going to take a period of time for the economy to even stabilize and for people to see any changes at all. Um, and it's something that uh, we fear is going to turn into a very conflictive situation. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me just round it out then, Christopher, if I can get your, your thoughts on, on the first question here. I just want to see really where everybody stands. I mean, how much confidence do you have in what he can do since he set some very lofty goals? Oh, well, I don't think anyone should have any confidence because this kind of libertarianism or turbo anarcho-capitalism hasn't been tried anywhere before. So the simple answer is, we don't know. I, I, I think, as uh, some of your previous commentators have said, uh, Argentina and Argentines at this point in time are willing to try anything other than the current status quo. How much patience they will have uh, to see whether this model, uh, this new model is going to work or not is another question again, uh, because as Javier Mille himself has said, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And it may not get better. It may just simply get worse. Yeah. Michael, let me come back to you because, uh, you know, it's not just about the economy. A lot of Argentinians uh, have been complaining about crime rates, for example. There are some statistics that say 80% of Argentinians actually feel security has just deteriorated terribly over the last six months in particular. Uh, but there you go. If Malay is such a libertarian, I mean, how much would security and law and order uh, be a priority for him? Well, I think he's got to focus on the economy and fix the economy. But clearly, as you say, security is a key concern in Argentina, and the situation has gotten worse. And, um, you know, I think he's put in place uh, Patricia Bullrich, who was the Minister of, the, of, of Security, who was had that position in the previous administration. So uh, I, th I think this is going to be, you know, he's tried to, he's tried to find people who have some experience in, in, in dealing with this problem. 
But clearly, there are risks uh, of going too far and human rights concerns and, and the like. And um, you have to strike the right balance of, of trying to address the security problem um, through better policing, but not, uh, you know, not not go too far and, and, and militarize the situation. And that that I think is a risk and a concern. But he can't avoid that because after the economy, I think that's the most uh, you know, that's that's the main concern that Argentines have today. Yeah, Jimena, you, from a human rights perspective in particular, what do you make of that question? The crime and security, how he's going to deal with that? And also with poverty rates, you know, at such dramatic levels, he wants to reject socialist policies and, and curb the welfare state, plus even ban abortion. I mean, can that work? Where do, where do his ideas really on social policy leave human rights standards? Okay, well, uh, in terms of crime, yes, Argentina has been uh, having a rise in crime, and some cities like Rosario are experiencing a very serious organized crime problem with uh, narco trafficking and so forth, and so he's going to have to address that. If we look at some of the people that he's put into his cabinet who are coming from the Macri administration, during the Macri administration, we saw mass protests, and that was met with quite a bit of uh, repression. And in some of the statements that he's made, which, again, we should take with a grain of salt because they're statements he's made and then changed his mind over time or measured, um, he said that he would make further use of the military. Uh, this not only brings back um, echoes of the dictatorship that was highly problematic and where many crimes were committed, but also led to grave human rights abuses. So we will have to see how this will be responded to by civil society. But how much Argentina military is there left to make something out of? Well, I mean, he has the power to put the military he has and the police in a role that they could be curbing um, such situation, and that could lead to violations, and that could deepen uh, the conflict in the areas. If we look at who he models, or he's at least said he likes, like uh, Jair Bolsonaro, this was a very, very conflictive period in Brazil. While Jair Bolsonaro had major support, he also um, put in place situations where you had severe human rights violations for those who were dissidents of Bolsonaro who did not fit the identity that Bolsonaro was making for the country, mostly LGBT folks, uh, feminists, and others. So we are concerned that while he is anti-abortion, that's fine that um, he may have the similar type of response towards the feminist movement in Argentina that has really uh, taken hold and grown in the past 10 years. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, Christopher, Jimena mentioned how he's changed his mind on, on several things. And, I mean, people have talked a lot about his backtracking already on so much of what he said. You know, he can't really afford to blow up the relationship with, with China and Brazil, for example. Uh, so tell us what you think he's going to pull back on, and might some of the tough talk, even on the security front, be pulled back as well? Uh, in terms of security, I, th I think absolutely so. Uh, in terms of the economy, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place because he doesn't necessarily have the votes to get everything that he wants through, but he was elected on a on a, 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 a cambios drásticos sin gradualismo, yeah? Drastic change without gradualism. And he's been elected on that ticket. So it's going to be difficult for him to row back too much. But at the same time, it's going to be difficult for him to get some of the more radical elements of his uh, his track record of his position through. Uh, most recently, for example, he's beginning to backtrack on dollarization, which mm. was supposedly a, a huge part uh, of his election. He's he's appointed Luis Caputo as his finance minister and Santiago Vasili as his governor of the central bank, neither of whom are fans of dollarization. Uh, so I think we will see some tacking to the center, but uh, at the same time, uh, we're going to see heavy doses of shock therapy as well. Uh, he's already announced a 5% cut in public spending across the board. He's already abolished nine of the 18 ministries. Uh, he's already looking to devalue the Argentine peso. So maybe not quite the kind of drastic change that we had on the campaign trail, but there's still drastic change very mm. much ahead mm -hmm. for the Quickly, economy. Quickly, yeah, what about the f foreign policy issues, though? I mean, when he threatens Brazil and China, you have to remember those are two of his biggest... Mm -hmm. trading partners. Is he really in a position to say, oh, forget you, 
you know, we, we can do this without you and I'm going to rely on the U.S. I'm sure the U.S. is happy to hear that, but uh, it's not doesn't sound very realistic. Well, that's a really interesting question, Andrea. I, I think maybe it is more realistic than we would think. I mean, don't forget, if he devalues the Argentine peso significantly, if he even does dollarize, uh, the way he's going to pay for that is basically by selling off the family silver. Yeah, Argentine land, Argentine capital will be going for bargain basement prices. And uh, the, the ri rich U.S. companies, rich U.S. individuals are going to be very well placed to invest in that. This is why the stock market's going up. There's going to be potentially an awful lot of money to be made uh, in this sell off. So maybe he is going to double down on Argentina, mm. uh, on the US, sorry. Having said that, though, he again, he's tacked to the middle. Uh, he's already reached out to, to Lula in Brazil. Uh, uh, he, I believe he's reached out to the Chinese, uh, perhaps not as much. He's looking to remove Argentina from Mercosur, though. Uh, it's not liberal enough for him. Right. Uh, so um, I, th I think it's a case of continuity and change, and it's going to be it's going to be uh, a bit of both. Yeah, uh, Michael, where do you stand on that? Uh, you know, where where he'll really go, re China, Brazil, but particularly China, you know, in exchange for a better relationship trade wise with the United States, is would it be a wise investment, or do you think now that he's thought it through, that's probably why he's backtracking a little bit? No, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I think uh, he really made a serious mistake by inviting Bolsonaro. I mean, this is, you could chalk this one up to, I think, inexperience. You have to remember that he is a total outsider and has no background in politics. So he was in, in, in Congress for two years. Um, this was the first time that a Brazilian president um, hasn't attended an inauguration of an, Arge of an inauguration of a new Argentine president. Uh, Lula was very uh, insulted, which he, he should have been. Uh, and this was a terrible misstep and uh, unfortunate. But um, the foreign minister, the new foreign minister, the animal Dina, went went to Brazil and talked to the foreign minister. And I think things will will get back on, on, on a reasonable course. And the same with the Chinese. The president Xi um, sent a congratulatory note to Malay that was very very nice, and Malay responded and sent best wishes to him and the Chinese people. You know, he has no choice. Uh, he's going to have to deal with Brazil and China. China, the two major uh, partners, economic partners of, of, of Argentina, and I think this is just pragmatism. And I think what we've seen is that we've seen a different Malay as president-elect uh, uh, than as candidate. As president, as candidate, he had very sharp rhetoric and very aggressive. As president-elect, he really toned it down and was more pragmatic. And I think as president, him, he's going to be even more pragmatic. He realizes that the economy, he's bet everything on the economy, and he's going to need the United States, he's going to need Brazil, and he's going to need uh, China very, very much in order to make this work. And it's a big Yeah, gamble. you say he's going to need the United States. Uh, quickly, Michael, I mean, do you think he's kind of hedging based on the fact that Trump could win re-election? And then I know you've said, if I'm not mistaken, that you don't think he wants to be part of a greater global right-wing alliance. But do you think it's in the back of his mind that if Trump comes to power in the U.S., I have a kindred spirit there, we can make Argentina great again together? I, I I really downplay that. I, I don't I don't see that. I mean, I think he did express admiration for Trump, um, and he did for Bolsonaro, as Jimena said. Um, but again, I think he's he just doesn't know. I mean, I think we should just be ignorant. And he's going to learn, and he has to learn very very quickly. I think he had a good visit here uh, in in Washington. He met with the National Security Advisor. He's got somebody in in as ambassador here who's very close to a lot of people. And so I I, I uh, you know I don't think he'll be upset if Trump is elected. But I think uh, if somebody else is elected uh, next November here, I think he's I think he's going to be, uh, you know, they okay. think there'll be a relationship. I mean, Jimena, do you have as much uh, kind of confidence in that he might be more measured and pragmatic as president and, you know, not just pull back on the rhetoric, but actually act in a more proactive, as Michael said, pragmatic way? Or do you think he's a dangerous man for Argentina and could blow up the system like he kind of promised to do in the worst terms? I really think we don't know, but I do think that the biggest thing he's backtracked on is his supposed complete uh, separation from the political caste, that, uh, what he calls the political caste, which are basically the status quo politicians. I mean, 
he basically had to make an alliance with Macristas and with Macri uh, unspoken understanding to be able to win. And we're already seeing that their influence is there within this new government. So if he continues in, in, in that vein, I think that um, he is going to be far more pragmatic. And uh, just like Michael said, there is no way that he can improve the situation economically in Argentina, cutting off Brazil, cutting off China. Um, I'm not sure the United States, beyond um, investors and multinationals and, and so forth, are going to be that interested in helping um, Argentina get off, gets off its feet. It's really not been on the radar in Washington at all for, for a long time now. And so um, I think he has no choice if he wants to see changes. Now, is that going to lead to also his hardline supporters turning on him as well and protesting because he's not doing exactly what he said before? I think that's going to be another question we have to look at. And another question we also haven't really explored is that he's not alone in this office. He needs congressional support to do what he wants to do. Uh, to what extent do you think he'll, he'd be able to even pass them, especially the most radical reforms he's looking at, uh, with Congress behind him? Jimena, go ahead. And then, Christopher, I, I want your answer on the same question. Go ahead. He, he has very little part of his uh, party and alliances in the Congress. I believe it's like 15 percent. He's totally going to have to do it, um, you know, convincing through coalition. He doesn't have um, his party or supporters in the governorships or the mayorships, so there's going to be a lot of resistance there. Um, so, yeah, he's going to have to uh, basically come up with agreements um, with all of these people to be able to advance even part of that agenda. I think there's going to be a lot of uh, blockage. Yeah. Christopher, are you on the same page there? Do you think uh, Congress in part would be able to, you know, rein in the worst? Yeah, I, I can totally agree with Jimena there. I mean, uh, in terms of um, his own party, La Libertad de Avanza, he has 39 of the 257 lower house seats. And in the Senate, he has seven of 72. So it's very small numbers. Even with his coalition with JXC and the Macristas, uh, who have 64 in the lower house, and according to La Nacion, 23 in the Senate, who will be willing to do a deal. That's still below half. Uh, having said that, uh, the Argentine uh, presidency is very powerful. Uh, Guillermo O'Donnell called it a delegative democracy. So he can rule through presidential decree, and there's an awful lot he can do through presidential decree. Having said that, the more um, uh, the more radical policies, particularly those around dollarization and those around abortion, let's say, will require uh, majorities in both houses, which he does not have. Final question, then. We're down to our last few minutes. Uh, Christopher, I'll let you take this first. Help us understand how much his character itself, or even arguably the character he put on during the campaign, with the chainsaw and then the foul language, how much did that actually appeal to Argentinians? Or was it strictly about just being desperate for any alternative, no matter what? I'm, I'm pretty much willing to uh, go for the latter, Andrea, rather than the former. And I think he won in spite of his antics, not because of them, which makes him very different to Donald Trump, shall we say, in the United States, uh, where his supporters absolutely love uh, his, his antics and what he gets up to. In Argentina, I think it very much was a case of desperation for change. Don't forget, we're talking about a country that has 143% inflation. Yeah, The central bank base rate is 133%. Imagine trying to live in an economy with those kinds of numbers, what day-to-day -day life is like. And this has been going on for years now. I, I think it is very much a case of winning in spite of his antics rather than because of them. And uh, the, the desperation amongst uh, many segments of Argentine uh, population uh, for a change. It is so interesting, though, because when you, you look at the Argentine numbers and, and how desperate they might look when it comes to the economy, you go to some of their neighboring countries and you see standards of living that are actually much worse. And, and that's what I fear for Argentina, is that uh, the alternative looks like an only hope, but technically, you can go from bad to worst, especially in the context uh, of a number of Latin American countries. But uh, unfortunately, Christopher, you're going to have to have the last word because we are completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists really so much uh, for being with us. Greatly appreciate it. And remember, you can follow us on X 
and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.